Amen. Um, let's start here in Ezra chapter 8. Appreciate everybody uh, being here. Like I said, um, tonight we have um, quite a few people on the prayer list um, and some things that were added uh, here earlier. I'll kind of get into some of those a little bit. Um, I want you to keep uh, Brother Jeff Bradshaw uh, in your prayer. Um, he was somebody that he had got in touch with us about, um, you know, I won't, I won't say what the donation was, and it wasn't money, but it was something for Kenya. And uh, I don't want to steal his blessing or anything like that, but this is what I've been telling people about when you're ready to serve God and you're ready to, to do, you just make a decision, you're going to do something, you're going you're to you know, witness to somebody or lead somebody to the Lord or you're going to just do something for the kingdom of God. And the devil says, you want to bet? And he'll kill you if he had the chance and he was able, he would kill you. Do we believe that? Of course we do. God, God specifically told Job, don't, or Satan, don't kill Job. Meaning he could have. We know from the New Testament that the devil has the power over death. We know that from the scriptures. But we were in the, we were in the midst of working out him sending this gift for the people of Kenya. And he was... From what he told me, if the car would have hit like six inches the other way, it would have killed him. As it is, he's banged up really, really bad in the hospital. And um, so uh, we found that out the other day. I've talked to him, and um, he is, he's got several things broken. They uh, transferred him three and a half hour ambulance ride to a, I guess it's like a rehabilitation hospital. And um, he's going to be there a while. And that just sounds like the devil to me. It's like, oh, really? You're going to serve God? Well, watch this. And he's banged up pretty bad. Now, but here's the neat thing his nurse is a Christian woman from Kenya. I talked to her on the phone. Wonderful, wonderful lady. And she just is absolutely tickled to death that, you know, we're, you know, he's part of this little church that's going to do something for her people in Kenya. So we're, we're glad to do it. But I'm telling you, Okay, I'm not, I'm not a good salesman for Christianity because if you're going to serve Jesus the right way, you will get beat up for it. It's a guaranteed thing. It's going to happen. And um, so that happens. And what you do is you stand up like Captain America and say, I can do this all day. Come on. And you probably will. So anyway, Jeff, buddy, we're praying for you. Uh, Tim Burns and his family. Uh, Rhonda called. She's hurting tonight. Um, Brian and Pam, they're both hurting tonight. And uh, so you pray for them. And we'll go through the list here in a little bit. Um, but I want to try to finish this up tonight, this study on prayer and fasting. And that way we can get it on a disc. We've already got orders for it. And um, so... Um, let me mention one more thing, and then we'll go. Just to give you a sign of the times, I mentioned Sunday that Pastor Kelly has got some ammo, and he, a he asked me if anybody in our church needed any. God bless him for that. Thank you, Brother Reg. I know he's not listening, but thank you, Brother Reg, for thinking of us, uh, because I asked around in the church, and... Um, we're going to be going down there in September, and I'm going to be bringing them back about probably close to 7,000 bullets. And, there, and he said, I'm going to save them back for you guys because they're going quick. 
And Joe tells me you can't find them at Dunn's, the two, two, threes, you can't find them. And um, that's because of the shape that our country's in right now. And it's not, it's no sign of it getting better. If your head's buried in the sand, get it out. If you're playing games with God still, stop, because you're going to lose. Okay? All right. Prayer and fasting. Let's read um, Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. And th this is a list now of things that you pray and fast for. Okay? Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us, and for our little ones, and for all our substance. There's the, there's the list there. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Now I want you to notice the statement, I was ashamed to inquire or require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen. Why should I ask the government or this world to do for me what God promised he would do? Amen? And it was important enough to them to fat, not just pray about it, to fast and pray about it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. And Father, we do lift up uh, all of the people down uh, south, Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, the Arkansas, any of those areas, God, that are going to be directly impacted by this hurricane. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would keep people safe. And Father, that during this time, people, Lord, who don't know you would call out for you, for their salvation, for their help. Father, there's no doubt in my mind that some people will die because of this storm. And Father, my prayer is, God, that before they take that step into eternity, God, that you would put it in their heart and they would cry out unto you. And though, God, you may have already decided to kill the body, Father, you saved the soul. And Father, we pray, dear God, that you would open up your hand tonight and feed your people the word, the bread of life. We thank you, dear God, for uh, sharing these great and mighty things with us. Father, remind us of things that we once studied and once knew. Or, Father, open up our eyes to things we've never seen before in Scripture. And, Lord, I just ask you, Father, as I did years ago, I ask you, Lord, to let me be a blessing to somebody tonight. So bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. So right here, he makes the list. We, we decided to afflict ourselves before our God. That's the, the, the why of fasting, is the affliction of the flesh. You t again, you're telling your flesh, no. But you're going to seek a right way, number one, to see God's way for us. This is what I was doing back November 2008, when... My wife knew what I was going through. I, uh, it was a, I was in a bad way. I was going to quit the ministry. I was going to get out. Or I was going to go somewhere else. I, I had no idea. But I knew God had to do something in me. Um, or I, I was just, I just flat refused to do anything else. God, I'm not going to do anything. You're going to have to do it. And so that led to shutting down we had a christian school we had a daycare shut all those things down and uh and it was time to do something different i had i didn't know at the time that we shut all those things down i didn't know what i would be doing but that's what god said god said shut it down so we shut it down and then after that god said okay now do this and then i'll, I'll never forget the day we started the watchman broadcast january 2009 and then in May, I think it was, of 2009, I was, again, I was in my office praying. I was just saying, God, you know, just 
lead me throughout my studies today, bless this day. And it's like God said, write this down. And I took a pen and I started writing down the things that we now put on disk. Um, and, and we've been doing that since May of 2009, what we call our watchman's packet or watcher's packet, uh, Sunday sermon DVD, watchman broadcast DVD, and then a, a disc of the audio of every sermon, every teaching that I do in that month goes on that disc. And we've been putting those out now since May of 2009. We were so excited. Sister Bonnie was here at the time helping me make DVDs. And she, we were tickled to death because we had 20 people on the list, Sister Betty. 20 people. And we were going, woo, praise the Lord, man, 20 people. Yeah, whatever. So anyway, but, and, you know, but that's how, that's how God does it. He may not tell you all at once everything he wants you to do. But do this. And then when you're ready, then we're going to do this, okay? But it was the right way for us, for our little ones, and for all of our substance. And then it says, verse 23, so we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Now, Nehemiah chapter 1, turn there. Nehemiah 1, 1 Samuel, Jonah, um, three different passages dealing with sin. Um, while you're turning to Nehemiah, I uh, mentioned to my wife, I had mentioned, I think in Sunday school class or church service uh, here the other day about Jerry Falwell Jr. And uh, you pray for him um, because he now is a multimillionaire. And I'll tell you why. When the photograph, it was sort of a lewd photograph of him and his wife's assistant on a yacht that went public. It went public because he posted it publicly to his Instagram account. And it just didn't look good. And they were talking about how the board of Liberty University, which is he's the director of, they were gonna ask him to step down. And I said at the time, I mean, that photograph ain't right. But to ask him to step down, I guarantee you there's something more to it. And, buddy, there is. All sorts of sordid things. Um, his wife having an affair with the pool boy. Some young man that they had hired to clean their pool. And this, young, this man says, yeah, and Falwell liked to watch. He was in on it. So get this, he's resigning his position and he gets $8 million out of his contract to resign with. Doesn't sound like he's very sorry to me. And this is not just something that just happened last week. This has been going on for years, okay? Everybody sins. Everybody has the devil eating them up with sin. There are sinners in this church. There are people that I know right now that are struggling with sin in our church. And I'm, I'm all for them, 100% for them. Okay? Because they're honest about it. Sometimes, and you don't have to do this, but sometimes people come and tell me, Pastor, I need you to pray with me. I got this going on in my life. I will, I will storm the gates of hell standing next to you. Okay? Because you're honest. You don't want this to rule you. You want to be forgiven. You don't want to go to hell when you die. Okay? So, if that's the case with you, it's like, it's like having cancer, knowing you have cancer, but then deciding that you're going to ignore it, and it will go away. It won't. The last time I hugged my grandmother, I knew it would be the last time I hugged my grandmother. She was so frail already. There's no doubt in my mind she knew she had cancer and didn't do anything about it. Okay? 
Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Notice he did not name how many days he fasted. He just said certain days. So there's no formula. There's no magic script here that if you fast for six days, three days, two days, whatever, then all your sins will be gone. He just said, I fasted, mourned certain days, prayed before the God of heaven, and, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants. And confess the sins of the children of Israel. Look at this. Is it possible that God, that I can pray that God will forgive the sins of my children and God forgive them? I think it's possible. I'm not saying it's an absolute. I think it's possible. He says, confess the sins of the children of Israel. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that maybe God will work in my children in such a way as they'll repent. Why? Because I prayed for them. See, I love my children, all of them. And they're just like their mom and daddy, who is just like our mom and daddy. We are sinners. My mom has prayed for me and my sister over the course of our, our entire life. And... God has heard my mother's prayer and forgiven the sins of her children. Okay? I have prayed for my children. God has heard my prayer and forgiven the sins of my children. Okay? Confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. So, let's say that Finally, finally, you come to grips with, that, with the idea that you have a problem. You've got an issue. There's something going on in your life. You're trying to, you've been trying to fight it. You've been trying to tell yourself, I'll get better. I'll, I'll quit. I'll just, I'll just walk away from it. I, I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm just going to, that's how, that's how. And it doesn't go away. You made, all, you made God all these promises and you didn't keep them. So now what are you going to do? If it's important enough to you, you'll fast. You'll fast. You'll pray. 1 Samuel 7, verse 6, And they gathered together to Mizpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. This situation here, they ended up losing the Ark of the Covenant because of their idolatry. The Philistines stole it, took it, set it before Dagon. And after a while, the Philistines realized, we don't want it either. And they sent it back to the Israelites. But then God began to deal with the children of Israel, and they all got together, and they fasted together as a nation. And they said, we're sorry. And God forgave their transgressions. God forgave their sins. The history of our country, and I'm talking about the early days of our country, from the Revolutionary War and before, is filled with God's people fasting and weeping and praying over their sins. Okay? And God heard them. God listened to them. God heard them. God was entreated of them. And God forgave their sins. I'm telling you, it works. Then, Jonah, chapter 3, turn there. This blesses me. God, you know the story. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. I missed one. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Aben, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. There we go. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah did not want to do it, refused to do it, decided he was going to hide from God, run away from God, went on a ship. Storm came up, 
Shipmates realized somebody on this has offended some god of some kind. Jonah admitted it was him. They tossed him over. Whale's belly three days. Third day comes out. Science says it's impossible. Who cares what science believes? As Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. That's what he said. And so Jonah then goes, preaches grudgingly to Nineveh. And I think in the back of, my, of his mind, Jonah didn't care if they repented or not, but he did what God told him to do. And if you look, Jonah chapter 3, um, verse 5. Let's back up to verse 4. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There's the number forty. Forty is always like a number of testing, trial, probation. The forty days and forty nights it rained. Uh, the twelve spies being in the land, spying out the land for forty days. And that's God is testing Israel if, to see if, he's going to if they're going to believe him or believe the story about the giants are there and they're too big and we can't beat them, so let's don't go in. There's that 40 there. Christ being tempted 40 days in the wilderness. So here you have another 40, uh, 40 days, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God. Imagine that. The 40 days, you could say, represents the gospel as well. They believed the gospel. They believed what God said. God was entreated. And God was going to forgive them. So they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Can you imagine all the rich people of this country all of a sudden believing the Bible, putting on sackcloth and saying, we're going to confess our sins before God. What a, what a day that would be. Probably not going to happen, but I sound like Jonah. But anyway, from the least of them, even to, to the greatest, even to the least of them, for the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And folks, the Holy Ghost has to do that. The Word of God is the only thing that can do that. It's the only thing that can make a king lay aside his regal garments, put on sackcloth, pour ashes over his royal head, and proclaim a fast throughout the city and say, we're all going to repent of our sins. I believe that God is going to destroy this city. Only the Word of God can do that. So it says in verse 7, He caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. He even made the cattle fast. Put them in a pen away from food and water. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And did God do that? Look at verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. They repented, so so did God. And in this case, the word repent simply means turn from the course that you're on. Now, you hear me say all the time, of course, God's people sin. That doesn't mean that you can come into a church, say a prayer, join the church, get baptized, and then continue the course that you're on just to keep sinning all I want to and it'll be okay. That's not how it is. 
You've got to want a different way, a different life. Uh, Ephesians 2, look at I turned right to it. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in other words, God says, you got to turn. You've, you have to want to live a different life. And if you want that different life, I will give it to you. I won't let the prince of the power of the air rule over you anymore. But if all you want to do is have like a quick ceremony that you think is going to guarantee you heaven for all of eternity. See, I'm, I'm trying to get in the mind of like Jerry Falwell Jr. What, what's he thinking? Continuing in obvious sin for years now, if these stories are true. What's he thinking? Well, the denomination that that church is part of, Southern Baptist, believes that once you pray a prayer of salvation, then you can never, ever, 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 ever do anything you can never go too far. You can never out sin. God has to save you no matter what. So what does that create in a person? I knew a man, and I'm not going to say who it was, but he used the excuse for most of his life. Well, when I was a kid, I got saved. And for most of his life, he used that excuse to never get in church, never repent, never let God deliver him from the things that he was doing, the way he was living. He used that as an excuse. And I think people do that. I think they use this idea, I got saved, I got saved when I was 8, when I was 10, when I was 14, and I'm okay for the rest of my life. That's what I think happens. But they fasted, and God was entreated and he heard their prayers, and God forgave their sins. Amen? Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. When you need help from the Lord. And that could be for anything. Let's say you're having relationship issues. You got, there's somebody in your life, it doesn't have to be a spouse. It could be anybody that you're having a hard time getting along with them, and really you have to get along with them. Maybe, maybe it's a work situation. Maybe it's somebody in your extended family or just any number of things. Maybe you need financial help. Can God pay people's bills? Does it all the time. Maybe, um, maybe you have a physical issue, a physical ailment, okay? Anything, Maybe you need help in your marriage, in your relationship. Maybe, maybe as a young person, you need help getting along with your parents. Maybe you need help dealing with the temptations of this world. Maybe there's something going on there and you, you can't talk to your parents. You can't talk to anybody about it. But you can certainly talk to God and you need help in your life. That's what God's there for. So 2 Chronicles 20, verse 2, There came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazazon Tamar, which is in En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. This is... The passage, I think it's probably the 
second or third sermon I ever preached in my life was from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and it was about Jehoshaphat. And if you look in that chapter, um, look at verse 14. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. If I remember right, that's probably about the third sermon I ever preached in my life. But that just stuck out to me as a young man, 16, 17 years old, something like that. I had already run into situations in life that I couldn't fix, that I couldn't handle, that I couldn't do it myself. And I knew if I didn't get help from the Lord, I wasn't going to get any help. And God, from that early age, had taught me how to fast to get help from the Lord. Now I look at that chapter and I, I talk about these three armies that's coming to get. That's my favorite, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. But those three armies stick out to me now because I know what they are. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And when you can't, when you realize you can't beat them, they're going to kill you. You'll fast and you'll ask help from God. Esther 4, verse 3, And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. What, what was going on in Esther? Haman, and I need to teach a lesson on the book of Esther, actually several lessons. Beautiful, beautiful book. When you understand who the characters are, what's being played out here. Haman's the devil. Okay, and he wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. Why? You're God's people. So Haman got it set up from the king, Ahasuerus, that he could kill all the Jews. And when the Jews found out, see, it, there was actually a law that said you could not walk around in town with sackcloth on, in mourning clothes. So here's Mordecai, who hates Haman. Haman hates Mordecai. Mordecai is a picture of Christ. And he's walking around in morning clothes. He's not talking about early in the morning. I'm talking about sackcloth clothes. And Esther, the queen, sends him clothes and says, Uncle, Uncle uh, Mordecai, can you put some clothes on? He said, I'm not doing it. You need to understand that when they start killing all the Jews, when they find out you're one, do you think because you're the king's wife that they're going to spare you? No way. And there was no decree from the king. There was no commandment from God. But when the Jews found out that they were going to be slaughtered, they fasted. And they wept. And they prayed. And they said, God, will you save us alive? And God did. And there is a Jewish holiday that is not a commandment from God. No commandment from God. Does anybody know what it is? Purim. Okay? It's the Jewish feast of Purim. No commandment from God that they had to celebrate this. They just did it anyway. Because, and I believe that when the Jews realize who the Messiah is, they'll understand who Mordecai was. They'll understand who Haman was. They'll get it, okay? Because they're still remembering that feast of Purim. They still celebrate it to this day. They still acknowledge it. And one of these days, their eyes are going to light up and they're going to go, oh, he's our Savior. Amen to that. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Now, in this, here's what I'm going to say. Everybody qualifies as a minister unto the Lord. Okay? Um, 
The Bible talks about we have been made kings and priests. Um, second, where is that? First Peter? Second Peter? First Peter. Verse 5, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, I like that passage because to me that says there are spirits that just need to be killed. Amen? Bad ones. Some spirits just need to be killed, sacrificed. Uh, Peter, in 2 Peter, Jude talks about these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Okay? So I think there's a literal application here. Some spirits just need to be killed. So every one of us, not just me, but my wife, I would say to my wife that every now and then she should fast and pray. Does she not have a ministry here? You better believe she does. I've mentioned to her before, I've mentioned to this church, she's the rock of our family. She's the one that our kids call. She's the one that helps our children and our grandchildren with what's going on in their life. Now, they listen to my preaching, but they listen to the law of their mother. That's biblical, okay? And in that sense, she has a ministry here that's very valuable to this church. It's valuable to me. It means something to me. Okay? So she has a ministry. Sister Betty, you have one. John, we know you have one. So does your wife. Okay? Joe, he's one of our trustees. He's one of the men that we count on, Sister Rose. But even you young people, Michael up there, all the people who sit in the pews Sunday after Sunday, you are still a minister of the Lord, a priesthood offering up spiritual sacrifices. And whatever that ministry is, God will let you know. Roy back there. Roy's a minister, okay? He's our ministry of defense, right? Okay? So Acts chapter 13, look at this. Now there were in the, in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with uh, Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So verse 3, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now this is really the first time Saul is, and you're going to see his name change here. After a while, he's going to be Paul. Saul was the old man. Paul's the new one. Okay? And Saul, Paul had already spent all of those years learning the doctrines from Jesus himself. But that's not... That's not, I mean, he's got the knowledge, but now he's going to work with that knowledge. And he has to be set aside. And it required fasting and praying. And maybe God was just going to work in Paul some of the things that lie ahead for Paul, some of the hardships that he was going to befall, some of the whippings he was going to get, some of the beatings that he was going to get, some of the near-death experiences, some of the shipwrecks. But it was a way to set these men aside for the work of the ministry. Now, you folks online, everybody's got one. Everybody. It's not everybody's job to preach. And... I don't know, maybe you're thinking that the only way I can be used of God is if I preach. There's a zillion other things God can do in a person's life and through a person's life. And if you're seeking out the Lord for something that you think maybe God's calling you to do something, maybe God's calling you to do this, God, why don't you spend some time fasting? And if God's serious about it, here's what I tell you. If God wants you to preach, you know what you're going to end up doing? Preaching. If 
God wants you to go to Kenya. You know what's going, you know what's going to happen? You're going to go to Kenya. If God doesn't want you to go to Kenya, you know what's going to happen? You're not going to go to Kenya. To me, it's always been that simple. We left this church because God made it clear to Lisa and I that we were to go to Richwoods, and we were there for three years. And I mean, all of a sudden, lo and behold, God started working in her, God started working in me, and God started working. Joe and Rose, you, you might remember this. Warren Bergman brought it up. Wouldn't it be something if Mike Hogger came back to this church? Boom. Okay? God knew what he was doing. But to set aside for the work of the ministry, you fast. Okay? Joel chapter 1. I think... Yeah, okay, we're, we're getting close. Joel chapter 1, very quickly. Verse 14. For restoration. Everybody in this room, everybody listening to me, God has, there are things that you've lost because of your disobedience to God. So Joel chapter 1 verse 14, Sanctify ye of fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under the clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? You know why they're groaning? They're starving to death. The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry. For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee. For the rivers of water are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Is there a reason to fast? You bet there is. And by the way, looks like here God's making it easy. What is there left to eat? Not much. Maybe it's time to fast in hopes that God would restore some of the things that because of your sin, He's destroyed. And I'm here to tell you, I know about this. When you won't listen to God, God will just start, start destroying things in your life. He'll destroy your reputation, He'll destroy your marriage, He'll destroy your lifestyle. He'll destroy your, your finances. He'll destroy your health. He'll bring you down to where you ain't got nothing left. Now it's time to fast and pray. Maybe, maybe you didn't, it hasn't gone too far. Maybe God can restore some things. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 15. Blow you the trumpet. In Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. And let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Why do you think we have Antifa and all that nonsense destroying our cities right now. Why do you think that's happening? And I'm here to tell you, Trump wins the election. It's about to get much worse. You'll wish you had all 6,000 rounds of that that I'm going to bring back. Why do you think God is letting all this stuff happen? Why is it happening in the cities? Because the cities is where the problems are. I won't say all of it, but a majority of it is. White and black. And I'm telling you, God, if God has to destroy this nation, read Leviticus 26. God does it seven things at a time. And if you won't listen to me for this, then I'll bring you seven more. And if you won't listen to me for that, I'm going to bring you seven more. So he says in verse, um, uh, let's see, verse 8. There it is. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And a stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Yes. 
Let me say this to you. God can not only make it as good as it was, God will make it better than it was. I know this firsthand. When I grew up reading the King James, believing it, being taught it, that was taken away from me for a time in my life. When God restored that back to me, I'm here to tell you, He put it back in me way better than it ever was, than it was the first time. Okay? Because, I, I mean, I believe it now. Okay? If that makes sense. Um, three things here, and then I'm done. Wrongful fasting. Wrongful fasting. Isaiah 58, 3. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. In other words, Lord, didn't you see us fasting? How come you're not paying attention to us? Well, here's what God said. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Remember what I started this thing out with. If you're going to fast, fast. Don't fast, go to work. Don't fast and have a family reunion. Don't fast and watch all your stuff on TV. If you're going to fast and pray, fast and pray. But that's what they did. They fasted, but they enjoyed it. What a great day it was. You find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate. Here's another one. You're fasting because there's a church split going on. And you want your side to beat up the other side. God says, I'm not going to hear it. You fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. God's saying, don't, don't you dare. Or, or let's say in your marriage. Oh, I'm tired of my wife treating me this way. I'm going to fast and pray that God will get her. Uh, you might be the one that God gets. Um, Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? And what was those Pharisees' deal? They were, they were relying on their works. And he said, Your disciples, how come we fast? And you're, if you think you're so spiritual and, you're, and your disciples are so good, how come they never fast? We fast. Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. No man putteth a piece of new cloth into an old garment. And this is attached to this. For that which is put in it to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither doth men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. If you're not saved... Don't bother fasting. It's that simple. If you're not even saved and are not wanting to be, just because you had a ritual of fasting, that doesn't mean that God has to do what you told him to do. If you want the new wine, let God make a new bottle for it, which is a new life, okay? Last one, Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men. I can't tell you the number of times I've said that. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the prayer I prayed while I was being electrocuted. Not... God, open up those gates. Here I come. Hallelujah. Uh-uh. God, have mercy on me. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. 
For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Okay? Pride. If you're going to fast, swallow your pride. Get rid of it. And I would say this to some people. I'm not going to say who I'm saying it to. Some of you know what kind of week I've had. And the pride that I've heard this past week. And I would say to some people, it's time to lose your pride. It's time to lose your pride. 